Hello everyone. So last time I showed you how to fetch data from Filestore and display it in your Swift UI application. And you might recall that after we wrote this piece of code, I told you that it was less than ideal. Why is that? So first of all, it makes a number of assumptions about the structure of our data that we're fetching from Firestore. So for example, here we assume that the title attribute is a string or that the pages attribute is an integer. So what happens if we change our minds and change the data types in our Firestore documents? Or what happens if we add new attributes to our Firestore documents? Or what happens if we add new properties to our Swift classes or structs? This code is likely going to break. Also, it is rather verbose and um, you know a lot of lines of code to write, and that's always a bad sign because less lines of code means less mistakes that we can make. So if you've been around in the Swift community for any length of time, you know that Apple has introduced the Codable API a while ago in Swift 4. So the Codable API makes it a lot easier to map data between your Swift classes or structs and an external representation such as a JSON file. So you might have been using the Codable API for mapping from JSON files to Swift structs. The good news is that Firestore also supports the Codable API, and today I'm going to show you how to make use of that. So let's dive right in. The first thing that we need to do is to add another pod to get support for this API. So Firebase Firestore Swift is the pod that we need. And then let me just quickly run pod install. And while we're waiting for this to finish, we can go back into our IDE and start updating our model here to make it codable. So the first thing we need to do is basically just say, this is codable, and usually that is enough. So if all the attributes match the attributes of your external representation, that's perfect. But you might recall that for a number of pages, we have a different attribute name in Firestore. Let me show you. So in here, you see we've got author, we've got title, but it's called pages. So what we need to do is we need to tell Swift that we want to use different attribute name here. And we can use, we can do that by implementing the coding keys um, enum, coding keys and then specifying the attribute names, coding key. So we need to provide all the attribute names here. So first of all, case title, case author, and these are just the same, so we don't change the attribute names here, but for a number of pages, it is pages actually. So we provide the name that we're using in our documents. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is, what about this ID attribute up here? We don't have an ID attribute in our document over there. So, um, but what we want to do is, um, so no ID attribute here, but we want to map our document ID to the ID attribute in our Swift struct here. And to do that, um, we will use a property wrapper that Firestore provides for us. So Firestore Swift, and then um, we can use this document ID property wrapper here to make this optional. And that means Whenever we map from a document into our book struct, Firestore will read the document ID of the document and map it into this ID attribute here. All right, so that's everything we needed to do in our model. Now let's go into our view model where we have this complicated 
piece of code which performs the mapping. So what we want to do is instead of doing all this, make things easier. And to make it easier, let me import this bundle here. And then we can do this query document snapshot dot data as, and you can see that this has decodable dot protocol. And what we need to do is we need to provide the class of um, the struct that we want to map into. So book dot self. So this tells the codable support we're using this class as a template that we want to map into. Right. So, um, and then let's got this with a try and then return this, comment out this piece of code here. And um, we're using a compact map. So whenever we return nil, this gets filtered out by the compact map. Right, so this basically should be it. Let me run this on the simulator. And if everything went well and I didn't screw up, we should see the same data in the simulator as we did last time. And there we go. So let me show you this at the same time. Okay, there we go. And just to prove that the, everything is still working, let me just change the number of pages here <clears throat> and uh, reduce the number of pages. And you can see that it has updated um, straight away. Cool. So this is how you map data if you're reading data. So now what how would this look like if we wanted to write data into Firestore? And to show you how this would look like, I'm just going to quickly implement a method for adding new data. So let me quickly do that. So function add book, and um, it receives um, a book instance. Book is a book. And then um, it's actually pretty straightforward. So we already have our DB instance here. So db.collection, and we want to write to the books collection. And then we want to add a new document, add document. And then you can see that we now have the option to use from encodable, perfect, because our book is encodable from book, just like that. And that's it. So um, the compiler will complain that this might throw, so we're going to do a little try here. That's one thing. And then it's also going to, um, um, well, that should be fine. Oh yeah, for sure. We need to wrap this. So do, and then catch this. And then if there is an error, we'll just print the error like this. Um, and then, yeah, I was looking for this. So we'll just discard the result like this. Right, and this is how you store data into Firestore. Pretty easy, right? So that's basically it. There are a couple of things that um, I would like to show you before I let you go. So first of all, let's go back here into our model. So um, we've been using the document ID property wrapper, and there are a few other property wrappers that are very useful. So let's go find out more about them. And to do so, let's go into our um, browser here and use the um, open source search engine. So this is a um, search engine that Google provides that you can use to search the source code for all of these projects here. And the Firebase SDK is here as well. And we want to search within the iOS SDK. So let's first start by looking for the document ID wrapper that we've been using before. And you can see here, it says something about codable. So that's probably the right place for us to start looking. So this is the source code for the document ID property wrapper. All right, 
So what about the other property wrappers that I promised you? So you can see that this is a property wrapper and then we'll just use that um, to search for all the other property wrappers. So there are three in total. And then we can look at the other one. So let's look at the server timestamp property wrapper first. So the documentation says um, that this is a type that can initialize itself from a Firestore timestamp, which makes it suitable for use with the add server timestamp property wrapper. All right, so what does it mean? Server timestamps are useful because the time on the server and the time on the user's devices will very likely not be in sync. So if you want to be sure that all your data in your Firestore instance um, has the same, uh, you know, um, adheres to the same clock essentially, then you want to use server timestamps, which is really important if you, if your um, application logic depends on everything being in sync with one clock instance, right? So, and this is where you want to use the server timestamp property wrapper. So for example, you would have an attribute on your Swift class, and then you would prefix that with add server timestamp. And then it would mean if your property in the Swift struct is nil, then at the time when it gets written into Firestore, the server will replace nil with the current server timestamp. And then if you have the same struct and it's already pre-filled with, with a timestamp and you write this back to the server again because some other attribute has changed, the server will not change the attribute which contains the timestamp. So this is pretty useful if you want to, if you want to do things like um, having a couple of attributes that track um, the created date for um, a document and the last updated date. So whenever you want to update the timestamp, just set it to nil and then write it back and the server will update it to the new timestamp. Um, there is a very good article by Doug Stevenson who um, goes into detail about um, what he calls the secrets of Firestore's field value dot server timestamp. So I recommend reading this article to get the lowdown of how server timestamps work like. Okay, so let's go back and look at the other um, property wrapper, which is explicit null. And this one is useful if you have an attribute that you want to store back into Firestore and it is nil on, on the client side. So in Swift, it is nil and you want to write it back into Firestore and you want to make sure that the attribute is written into Firestore. If you have cases like that, use this property wrapper. If you don't use it and your attribute is nil and you write the document back to Firestore, it will not write the attribute. So if you want to make sure that the attribute is written, use this property wrapper. All right, um, that is, these are the property wrappers. Let's go back into our code. All right. So that was it. Um, that was a very quick introduction how to use Codable in Firestore. Um, I encourage you to give it a try um, and use it in your applications. So this obviously also applies to regular Swift applications, um, not just Swift UI applications. Um, let us know how you like it. And if you run into any issues, please feel free to leave us a comment on our GitHub repository. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.